Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank, and welcome to another episode of The Remnant Call. Glad to be here tonight with you, and folks, I'm excited because Brother Jamie Walden is coming back on the show here tonight with us, and it is getting so incredibly real night now as a believer. And folks, we must remember that through everything that's going on right now, the mission has never changed. We are to go out into the world to every living creature, and we need to share the good news. Jesus is coming again and share that good news that he can save your life and he can take you and be with him forever one day. But folks, we've got to be intentional about this. The last thing you want to do is get to the end of your life and look back and say, man, I wish I did this. I wish I would have had the courage. No, God wants us to be like the apostle Paul. When we get to the end of our life to say this, I fought the good fight. Doesn't mean I was perfect. Doesn't mean you did everything right. Doesn't mean you didn't miss some opportunities, but you were willing to, when you messed up, to repent and to keep moving forward and always keep at the front of your mind that it's all about Jesus. It's all about our Heavenly Father. It's all about his kingdom and what is coming. And we must be ready to do whatever our Heavenly Father asks us to do in this last hour. So with that, I'm going to bring on our guest tonight. Brother Jamie, are you here with me? Yeah, I'm here, brother. Thanks for having me on again. Amen. Thank you so much, Jamie, coming back on here. And folks, uh, you know him by now. (laughs) This is Jamie Walden from Omega Dynamics. And brother, you... uh, I, I want to get into the show, but I, I just want to do a quick update. You've got a lot of things that have been going on at your new place. Could you just take a second and share what's happening out there at the ranch? Yeah, I mean, we're we're actually in the process of, you know, we're building out this faith haven. The Lord gave me that burden about two years ago and been actually traveling around the country and and uh, helping get faith havens established all over the nation. And I, I say faith havens because I know that the Lord is going to provide for his people in a time of great perplexity and suffering coming upon this nation. I mean, we're assured it, we're promised it. Uh, you and I were talking off air. I'm utterly convinced. Um, I'm always willing to be proved wrong, but I'm utterly convinced that America is mystery Babylon. And as we can see the handwriting on the wall, uh, devoid of the Neo-Babylonian blindness, where we're sitting there drinking out of the golden vessels of the Lord, while the Assyrians are literally beating down the gates of our city. uh, We're in a reality right now that's burgeoning on the scene that uh, could very well be the prophetic fulfillment of Jeremiah 50 and 51 and Revelation 18 and elsewhere about the fall of the nation whose foundations are the bloodshed of the innocent, which is truly the United States of America and everything that we've done globally. So, yeah, we've been out here working like crazy. Um, you know, we, we uh, just as donations come in, as the Lord provides, we're building out this place. We have uh, a lodge and several cavern- cabins on this property. We host, we'll be hosting different um, Christian encouragement and training events, you know, and, and spiritual leadership. And actually what our focus on is uh, building in resiliency and families for the days ahead so that they can contari- continue to carry the gospel unabated so that they're not easily shaken. So their hearts are steadfast and secure in the Lord almighty so that they are adequately properly prepared physically, mentally, and emotionally to advance the gospel through the fog of war. Cause we're assured that there was going to come a time of likes of which never has been and never will be again. But it says that those who are wise in the Lord will turn many back to righteousness. Daniel 12. We're also in Daniel 11 that those who know their God will be strong and go forth and do exploits. We're told that the Lord will provide for his people for a time times and half a time in the wilderness. We're assured of all these different things. So like you said in your intro, man, the mission set goes on unabated, unabated, like honor, courage, and commitment, devotion to duty to the end and whatever our end is. And we ought to be like the apostle Paul, who too proclaims like, Lord, let me take hold of that for which you take hold and hold of me. And God, let me not be unwise, but wise, discerning the time for the days are evil, redeeming the time for the days are evil. And like, there is a mission set 
in this generation to turn many back to righteousness. I say all the time, one of the most often overlooked verses, you know, talking about as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of son of man that has all the, all the different layers to it, right? From the cultural to the physical, to the spiritual, to the transhumanism, to the genetic corruption of the human race and all these different things. But here's one unique aspect about the days of Noah that very few tend to touch on is that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And it's interesting that it says in the time of the end, those who are wise in the Lord will turn many back to righteousness and they'll shine like bright shining stars in the vast expanse of the universe from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. So yeah, man, we're just out here working like crazy, uh, doing what we can, you know, we, we, we took over this, this camp in, in Colorado, outside Durango, Colorado, not knowing what to expect. It's in fairly, uh, you know, fairly, uh, I don't know, subpar conditions. I can't think of the right adjective. I mean, it's a huge blessing. Don't get me wrong. I don't ever want to diminish that. It just needs a lot of TLC, a lot of TLC. So, um, you know, I have a background from all the other random jobs, but I've been a home builder and the other family that's out here ministering with us. He's a general contractor from uh, Florida and also worked in counter human sex trafficking and, and uh, sex trafficking victim rehabilitation in the Dominican Republic. Uh, that's where we actually met was in the mission field down there in the DR. And so they're out here as well, too. And we're just working like crazy as the Lord provides. And the Lord has told me, my people are coming. Prepare the land if my people are coming. And it's like, I don't know what that means. We'll just keep working. So, Amen. Well, praise God <laughs> for that, bro. That's exciting. And folks, you know, he was right. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And the other sign was it'll be as in the days of lots. So we as believers will be preaching through a time when it is like the days of lot. At the same time, we need to still continue to preach. So it doesn't matter how evil and wicked and how debaucherous this world and how perverse uh, relationships become, we still have a duty to preach the righteous gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, brother, thank you for that. And I just wanted to say anything, brother, I'm going to ask if you could open up the word of prayer, but I just want to say everybody keep my daughter, my youngest daughter. She just she just left yesterday. She is on her first mission trip. Um, we are so excited. She is, she is, um, going out for her first experience. And, uh, my prayer is this becomes, uh, well, you know what it's like when, once you've been bitten by the mission bug. Okay. Once you've seen somebody, what, what happens when Jesus fills a people in a far, it's, it's unbelievable. And so my prayer is that this will be the beginning of my youngest daughter's uh, rest of her life in serving other people. So brother, if you could pray for us, I'd really appreciate it tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to still be found gathering together, even through this technology, God, to be able to uh, just proclaim your excellencies, Lord, Pro Claim your dominion over darkness and your triumph over them, shaming them at the cross. And I thank you that we have the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And like Psalm 103 says that you don't treat us the way our sins deserve or according to our iniquities and you heal all of our wounds and you cure all of our diseases, God. And, and we just thank you and praise you that you've made a way for us to come so boldly and confidently into your throne room. And I praise you, God, that in a time of perplexity, of uncertainty, of, of anxieties and dissipations, Lord. We know that uh, those who fear you are blessed and their children are mighty in the land. And we are not easily shaken. We are not of those who fear bad news. We're those who fear the Lord and are steadfast. We fear the Lord and our hearts are secure, as Psalm 112 says. And I, I just praise you for the hope that we have, God, that we can be like Paul in Philippians 1 that says, I eagerly expect, I have an eager expectation that I'll no way be ashamed, but that now as always, I will have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted in me, whether by Hallelujah. life or by death, it doesn't matter. And that we are not frightened in any way by these things that are coming upon us. It will be a sign to them that they're being destroyed, but that we, that we are being saved, God. So I just praise you for your spirit and for the fearlessness that you've given us because you've delivered us from the curse of the sting of death and, and the curse of this failing flesh. 
and that we are among those who are more than conquerors and that do overcome when we know and understand the power and the sufficiency and the propitiation of the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony is bold and unmovable and steadfast. And we do not love our lives so much as we're afraid to lose it because we know it's been bought and paid for with a price that's imperishable and incorruptible, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore our lives are hidden in him. And I just pray that we'd be reminded of that tonight, God, even as we wrestle out the reality of the world around us Amen. and what our roles and mission is in it, God, we know that you, Christ Jesus, are seated on your throne. You are not bothered by these things that are going on. You are not perplexed. You are not anxious. You do not grow weary or faint, Lord. Amen. You are seated because you have supremacy over all these things through the empty tomb. And so we just praise you for that, Lord, and bless our conversation and give us words that glorify you, Lord. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, thank you so much. God bless you for that prayer. Folks, I'm just going to kick this off with a verse tonight. Not that we haven't kicked it off already, but praise God. I just want to open this up uh, from Revelation chapter 18. And and I just want to set the stage for what's ahead. For in one hour, so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto that great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea and by reason. Man, it sounds like somebody, it sounds like our port off Los Angeles there. Sorry. Um, and, and wherein were made rich all that had ships by sea by reason of her costliness for in one hour is she made desolate. Folks, Mystery Babylon. I was brought up with the whole, this is, you know, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. That has to do with the Holy Roman Empire. That's Rome, everything. And, and trust me, I'm not giving Rome a free pass. Okay. I believe they have a major part to play in the end times. Don't, the, 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 that is a, a terrible place. And I'm not giving that a free pass. But what I'm trying to tell you is there is only one place in this world that if they went up in one hour, now you got to remember, this has to be the largest importer of the world's goods that, that cause all of the people who traded by sea and by everything to weep and wail because no one buys their goods anymore. If Russia went up in one hour, no one would, no one buy their goods. Would they, would the whole world weep? Well, they might weep for the people, but they wouldn't weep because no one bought their goods anymore because America is the number one importer and China. Well, they're the big exporter. And so you got to look at this verse and say, okay, there's a there's something that's going on here that when this actual destruction happens, it will be swift in one hour. And and brother Jamie, that was what happened in ancient Babylon. They thought that they could, as you're you know ta- drinking out of the holy vessels of God, thought they could party and all that thing with the you know they could dishonor the God of heaven by drinking their wine out of his you know cups and that would be okay. Well, they went in that night thinking it was going to be just another good party, and they woke up with a change in command in their nation the next morning, brother. Turn it over to you. Absolutely. It, what it has to do with, especially in the United States of America, is a neo-Babylonian blindness. And if you notice, it's mystery Babylon. It's the daughter of Babylon. It's an offshoot of Babylon. It has all the spiritual tensions of the original Babylon, but it is a, it's a, it's a prodigy. It's an offspring of Babylon with this mystery Babylon that rises up. And just like in ancient Babylon, what we have now too, in an American particular, in America in general, but in the Western centric Christianity in particular is a neo-Babylonian blindness. This is why the scripture says, woe to the complacent, woe to you who lounge on your couches and luxury. Woe. Uh, How about woe to the lady to see in church who says you you're wealthy and in need of nothing, but you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And it's the only church age that the Lord is on the outside of the church trying to get back into it. And all this speaks to the spirit of this particular age of this particular nation. Some of the other attributes of this mystery of Babylon that, that must be noted is that it goes into great detail about who the mysterious 
Babylon is. And it's the center of culture. It's the center of entertainment. It's the center of the COMEX, the precious metals exchange. This is all of this is New York. Think Broadway, think Hollywood, think precious metal exchange, thanks Wall Street. It's the center of mercantilism, where the majority of all trade uh, uh, exchanges, currency exchanges occur. Again, that's New York City. It goes on and on and on through all these attributes. Here's one of the most, and, and it is. And it has made the whole world drunk with its pharmacia, with its sorceries, with its pharmaceuticals. The United States of America consumes 90% of all pharmaceuticals in the world. The United States of America single-handedly through the pandemic polluted the whole world with their pharmacia. The whole world in a matter of three months. They made almost every individual on the face of the earth take their sorceries into their bodies with mRNA messenger, which another word for messenger is angel ribonucleic acid into their bodies to alter their very genetic makeup, to make them, to make them in some degree an affront to the Lord, or at least to bring on a greater curse of sin and death in their physical bodies. This is all being done. And here's, here's the last attribute of mystery Babylon. That is that the American Christian must understand is that they trafficked in the souls of men. That is not yes. the Vatican. That is not Russia. That is not a revived Holy Roman Empire. That is not a revived Ottoman Empire. That is not a revived ancient Babylon in Al Hila, Iraq, which I have personally been to the Ishtar gates and seen the stones with Nebuchadnezzar's name etched on them. I've been there. I've been in the hanging gardens of Babylon, the restored hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. That's not what it is. America's chief exports, number one, number two, and number three, is child sex trafficking, number one. Number two, pornography, primarily centered around children. And number three, pharmaceuticals. One, two, and three primary exports. The whole Ukraine crisis, well, not the whole, the significant amount of the Ukrainian quote unquote crisis is centered on the fact that it is the United States of America with Great Britain. It is the hub of all child sex trafficking in the world from America through Ukraine. That's what the Hunter Biden lab tap is a part of. That's what the Burisma thing is a part of. That's what the, all the payouts and all the money laundering comes through there. This is why Zelensky is doing what he's doing. He is a puppet proxy of the United States of America. It is the number one. It is the hub from which all the spokes go out for the global child sex trafficking is Ukraine. If that gives context to, for people for what's actually going on over there and why it's going on. So this concept is an unbelievably big deal to know and understand because like the scripture says, brother Frank, in a single day, in a single hour, in a single day, in a single hour. And what it presupposes as it does elsewhere throughout scriptures with regards to the fall of Babylon is that there is a degree of normalcy. And then there's not just like in the original Babylon, they were eating and drinking and in hubris thought, I'll never be a widow. I'll never see shame. Where is this God of judgment? All the prophets are just when and all their words come to nothing as they drink out of the golden vessels. And I've done the research on this because I'm a logistics guy, you know, from Marine Corps infantry is, is how, how would they not have known that they were coming down again. How could they have not known? So I did the research and it says that there were about the potential estimates are 600,000 troops with their logistics trains and everything combined moving across open territory for two years to get to fulfill that prophetic word that night when they saw the handwriting on a wall. And you're telling me nobody saw it coming, but listen, it's true nobody saw it coming because that's what's been going on in America. There's Chinese troops to the south of us. There's Russian bombers in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. There's Chinese armor brigades on Vancouver Island just uh, waiting to come up the Columbia River Gorge. There is, um, it's been outed with political official after political official. Their Chinese ties, their Chinese payoffs. The head of MIT is paid off by China. The head of Harvard is paid off by China. The whole Wuhan lab, everything. China, whenever you hear China, hear Russia. Whenever you hear Russia, hear China. It's a done deal, ladies and gents. And it will be business as usual until in a single day and a single hour because our cup of iniquity is overflowed. We drink it to the dregs and then we shake our fists in the face of God and say, give me more, God. That's the spirit of, of America. 
it is going to happen because the Lord has assured us it's going to happen. And what we see right now, anybody with ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches is listen to what is being said globally and watch what's happening. The stage is being set on purpose from our elected officials inside America for the systematic demolition of everything that you've ever known to be normal. And it's going to happen instantly. The whole Russia thing is just to build up plausible, plausible deniability to completely implode the global economy, in particular America, to have false flag nuclear strikes or bi biological attacks or cyber warfare attacks in order to consolidate power one more time. And, and from their language, the final time into a one world government with a one world currency backed by blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. That's where all this is going. And they do not hide it. They've been telling you about the Great Reset for a long time. They've been telling you about the systematic destruction of America. They've been telling you that the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. The Russians are just playing their part on the big stage of, of globalist uh, theatrics. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just just a synopsis, not even getting into the details. I agree. And, and folks, these here's the thing, you know, I, I've, I've always been, you know, politically conservative. OK, myself personally. But I can tell you right now, these parties need they are so corrupt on both sides. They are warmongers on both sides. You've heard it even this week. And where are the Republicans that are truly out there fighting for lowering down their gas price and doing something and stopping this mess? There's only a few voices here and there. It's completely this is you got to step back at one at some point and say, OK, this looks like something that is being done by design. The systematic destruction of the United States is happening right before our very eyes, and they love it. They seem to want it, and nothing seems to want to deter them. Nobody's really stamping up and taking any action. They keep thinking, well, I'll just wait till the 2022 elections, and then we'll get it right. Folks, there is a thing called beyond the point of no return. That when you continue down a path so far and so wickedness, and Jamie, I want to get into this because United States, you know, we have some very sketchy characters, obviously, in the foundation of our country, but we also have some very good God fearing people that started with the Puritans wanting to just have freedom uh, to practice their religion. Okay. Uh, not freedom to practice Satanism, actually, freedom to be a Christian. That was the original intent. Okay. Not to let everything fly in this country. But there were some good God-fearing people in the beginning. But just because you start out one way, just because you begin your life with a few, you know, praise Jesus and a, and a, and a you know, couple of times coming to church and everything's going good. If a nation then turns, the Bible has some very, some extremely important words that are devastating. Because if you look in history, never has a nation been judged more harshly than Israel. The Israel is the most judged nation in history, period, bar none. No, never been a worse judged people because they were called by God. They carried his name. And when they would turn from him and we, we sometimes read the Bible, and we're thinking, oh, well, I'm only just, you know, a couple of pages later. That couple of pages could be 100 years or so. And, and so finally, God brings judgment and, you know, and eventually Lord, many times they repent. But there comes a time when it's the end of time and things begin to happen. And brother, we were talking about this earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Lord is not happy with the people who claim his name and then turn and walk contrary to it, brother. The thing like it's the adage of to whom much is given, much is required. And you're absolutely right. There's never been a more judged nation in the history of humanity from the onset of the garden than the nation of Israel. And then there's never been, so this is a second, there's always a type and shadow, right? There's never been a nation in the church dispensation and the New Testament age of grace that has been so supernaturally afforded the blessings of God because it was a haven for the authentic gospel to be proclaimed below, boldly than the United States of America. So again, to whom much is given, much is required. So just like Israel 
that intermarried and mingled the holy race with all the nations around him. And woe to those who went down to Egypt, made an alliance, but not by my will, and who ran after the idols of all the other nations. So too, the United States of America has done the same thing. But what's even more horrific is I've done a comparative study, right? I have a degree in history and stuff like that. Comparative study. They say at the, like I, the statistics of the height of Israel's wickedness, what they were doing to the to the giving of their children to Moloch and and the and the pouring out the blood of their children, they say the United States of America has exceeded the wickedness of Israel and Phoenicia and Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and Sidonia and all these other ancient cultures that we have exceeded it times one thousand when you do the comparative studies of the numbers. Amen. And we and we think God's not going to respond because we have churches in our country. Well, the reason why God is going to respond so harshly is because we have churches in our country, because we have access freely to the word of God, because we can pro- proclaim righteousness and truth in the streets all day long and at, at our, our, our Capitol buildings and in our school board meetings and everywhere. And we choose not to out of cowardice. So notice who the first people are that God cast into the lake of fire when it's all said and done. It's the cowards, the cowards. The Lord has a very, very unique, uh, just judgment for cowardice people. It's very near and dear to his heart. Let me give this quick rundown, Deuteronomy 28, of the of the of the curses that come come against a nation. This is talking to Israel, but it's any nation who rejects the word of the Lord. So I'll give you a quick rundown. See if any of this relates to the United States of America. They'll be filled with compute confusion. Uh at the rebuke, any everything in their hands will be rebuked. Suddenly they will be ruined in an instance. Plague and disease will overcome them. Wasting disease, fever, in, fever, inflammation, scorching heat, drought, blight, and mildew will overtake their crops. So they'll have great food scarcity. They will be defeated before their enemies. They will become a horde to all the kingdoms of the earth. They will suffer the boils of Egypt. They will be afflicted with madness like insanity, like girls or boys, girls, boys or girls, they'll be afflicted with madness, blindness, confusion of mind. They'll grow up around like a blind man in the dark. They will be unsuccessful in everything you do. They will build their houses, but not live in it. Enemies from a distant land whose own God is their strength will come and take you over. All your allies will conspire against you and turn against you while you are unaware. Uh, swarms of locusts will overcome you. You'll plant much in the fields, but nothing will come out of the fields. And it says, because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, Therefore, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in dire poverty, you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will lay siege to all your cities throughout your land until all the high fortified walls in which you trust economics will fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land. The Lord, your God, is giving you and and it goes on and on and on from there we're specifically told in isaiah and jeremiah and lamentation and ezekiel and obadiah that all those who were once considered your lovers or allies is translated lovers or allies depending on your translation that you have given yourself over to are conspiring to overthrow you in a single day and I, it's funny because I just not fun. It's not funny, but I just read an article today how Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Brazil, and I can't remember who else will not take any phone calls from the United States of America from the presidential office. Our allies. I read where our France and Germany had a backroom meeting with Putin because they're all pivoting towards Russia. Uh, Putin just had a meeting with the Israeli Knesset, our parliament or, or, or whatever the ruling party is in Israel, like three days ago. They're all conspiring for the global for the takedown of the U.S. dollar and our hegemony in order to. And this is and our elected officials are in on this, by the way. This is not we're not like victims. This is all planned to bring about a restructuring of the entire globe and a consolidation of a globalized government and a centralized currency. And it's going down in real time, ladies and gents.
it, it is going down in real time. And, and that's the whole point of, of what's going on. It's like the snowball started and they, I don't know if it's just like, this is the day that they planned it was going to happen or if they realized this was the moment that they can finally get it done, but they started it and I don't see that they want to end it. And here's the big thing, folks, that we're not really quite understanding yet. We're seeing, trust me, I'm a business owner. Okay. I have, there's 11 of us, right? The work 10 employees that work for me. And we have a fleet of vehicles, you know, and it's an, I run, own an IT company and I have a big old truck. I had to ground my truck because the gas prices, uh, you know, I just said, you know, I don't want to spend this money and I'm, you know, trying to drive a little bit of a gas zipper, but I know what's coming. See, I know that all the prices, see the prices worldwide for everything has gone up tremendously. We can't even find goods hardly, let alone even bid them because they're not in stock anywhere. It's so difficult for us to even do a bid. Now on top of it, the, the, our gas, our petroleum is raising so fast in this country that we, we will see here in coming weeks, our food, everything we know will begin to take off. If, if this gas continues to go the same way, so expensive. And as we see that what happened in Revelation chapter 18, how it happened so quickly, we're going to look back in like a moment and say, I can't believe how quickly this changed. Well, according to what Jamie was just sharing in Revelation, I mean, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, when a nation turns against the Lord and his judgment is proclaimed, we better look out and we better either get on his plan or we better, we better, <laughs> we better hope that we die before this thing really goes down because you do not want to be there when the Bible talks about men's hearts will be failing them from just the fear of what's coming upon the earth. You don't want to be alive. Oh, you know at that what, brother Frank, like, like what, what, I, what I didn't even, what I didn't even cover there in Deuteronomy 28 is, is, and this is the global food scarcity crisis. This is the black horse riding. This is a day's wages for a loaf of bread. That's a global hyperinflationary economy. And what comes after a global hyperinflationary economy and all these rises is the inability to produce food because of the cost to produce it is too much. And Russia cut off all ex- Exports of fertilizer, which 5 million people on the face of the earth require Russian fertilizer to grow food. Uh, Ukraine and Russia represent 30% of the world's global wheat exports. They are not putting wheat in the ground this year. This is all perfectly designed to create mass famine. When you have famine, you always have plagues. And when you have famine and plagues, you always have pestilence. And then when you have famine, plagues, and pestilence, you always have wars crossing boundaries. And when you have all that, then you have global hyperinflationary thing. So you literally see how the Christ, when he, whenever his time is to break the seals, they're not these isolated Uh, compartmentalized incidents. They're all simultaneously, ladies and gents. They're all going on simultaneously at the same time. But here's what it says in Deuteronomy 28, is it speaks to the fact that that nation coming against you because of your wickedness and because the cup of the cup of your iniquity is so overflowing that you will cannibalize your children in sheer desperation. It talks over and over and over again about the judgment on Israel and the fact that it is so horrible when the God, when God does business with you, that the women covet the afterbirth of their child in secret and the husband eats of the flesh of his wife's womb in secret. And they're hiding their children as they're eating them from one another because it is that terrible. It says, it says men will want to gouge out their eyes for fear of what they're looking at. It says that they, they're anxious in their eyes and they're it, they're anxious in their minds and their eyes are weary and their hearts fail them for fear of what they see coming on the earth and yet and yet we have the mass majority of american christians that think they can sit around and drink out of the golden vessels of god and mock him and test him saying i'll never be a widow i'll never see harm i am the lord's elect and chosen nothing will come near my tent and, it, and it's a total lie. The message of the day is the same as it's always been. Repent for the day of Lord is at hand. It's consecrate yourselves today for you made been made liable on the field of destruction. You will fall before your enemies unless you remove the devoted things from among, among your camp. In Joshua 7, it's repent for the day of Lord is at hand. Repent for the day of Lord is at hand. First, first the, the message of, of uh 
John the Baptist, repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. The message of Christ after the devil of the Holy Spirit befalls him, repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. The first message preached after the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost with many other words, Peter warned them saying, repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. And many were added to their numbers that day. The message is never change. It's fix your eyes on Christ Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. May he open your eyes so that you can see your nakedness because he's counseled you to come and buy from him white raiments to cover your nakedness, to cover your shame. He said, buy from me gold that's been purified. Quit running after your 401ks and your Babylonian money magic systems, building your own houses and living in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins. I mean, listen to the word of the Lord, ladies and gents, from Genesis to Revelation to his people. He's like, come out from among them. Touch no unclean thing, lest, listen for the people of God, just like for Israel, same for the church, lest you partake in a double portion of her plagues. We get a double portion because of complacency. We get a double portion of the justice of God because to whom much is given, much is required. We get a double portion because he said, if you sow according to the flesh, you will reap destruction. You knew better. You had my spirit. You had my word. You had my truth. You had my freedom. You had no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by it, dicks, its dictates, surely you will die. But if by the power of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live and you deliberately, the second Peter two or three, I can't remember. It says, but you deliberately forgot. You willfully chose ignorance as bliss. You wanted the entire bliss translates as intoxication or enchantments. You chose to be intoxicated and enchanted with the things of the world. They deliberately choose to refuse to believe that the same God who judged the earth with the deluge is coming again to judge it by fire it's willful it's deliberate and it's costly so we must get this right brother we must get this right brothers and sisters and fixing our eyes on the lord we cannot be negligent in this late hour it says be sober-minded vigilant in eager anticipation return of the lord you're to be waiting looking watching dressed ready for the bridegroom to repair you're to be have your oil your your wicks trimmed so that your light burns brightly the extra stores of oil the fullness of the holy spirit so that you can endure even into the third and the fourth watch of the night waiting for your savior to return you're to be adequately prepared properly prepared physically, men mentally, and emotionally to endure to the end because those who endure to the end will receive the crown of life. Hallelujah. Whew. Folks, that's difficult words spoken right there. There's no sugarcoating what was just stated, yet that's the very word of God. That's what the Bible says. But the good news is that's not God's plan for us, okay? That's the plan for the half-hearted, one foot in, one foot out, walking in compromise, the lukewarm, can't make a commitment church. That's the church of the United States. But for us as believers in the Lord, that's not his desire. So if that scares you, I've got good news for you. God has a better plan for us as believers. And I want to get into that brother. Cause man, we're already flying right along. And Jamie, you just get me so wound up. I, uh, man, praise God. And this is true. This is intense stuff. God wants us to take action now about what is going on, not only in this world, but in our lives, in our hearts, in, in our spiritual walk. And I want to share a verse with you, two verses with you that are very important because I think they're fitting towards the, uh, the hour that we are in. And so the first one comes from Proverbs. Let me turn there real quick. Chapter six. I think it's around here. Okay. Starting in verse six, go to the ant thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide overseer or ruler provideth her meat in the summer and garneth her food in the harvest, meaning that the ant, look at the little ant. Nobody's down there telling them what to do, but they know that in order for them to survive, that they must get together preparations for the winter months, for the tough times that are coming ahead. And the ant doesn't wait around to the last minute to get the preparations done. No, the ant does the opposite so that when the tough times are here, the ant is fully prepared and stocked up and ready to go. 
The Bible also talks about in the book of Proverbs about the prudent man. And let me share this from you here in the in Proverbs also here. Oh, sorry, here. Let me open this up. Proverbs. Okay, here it is. Proverbs 22 and verse 3. Listen to what the word of God says. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. In other words, when the prudent man sees that something bad is going on, he takes cover. He goes in his shelter. But the idiot stands out there and waits for the destruction to come and wipe him out. Folks, this is a spiritual and a physical application simultaneously. Both of these verses are. We are living in a time where God has shown us the big picture of what's going on. We have seen the world that's going on. We understand the times that are going on, and we can make a quick choice right now. Should we prepare spiritually? Should we begin to seek the Lord like we've never known him before? Should we maybe put away some extra food? Not that it can deliver us, but maybe give us some time to to get our heads clear when everything falls apart. Or do we sit around and say, you know what? I'll just have a thief on the cross moment. I'll just wait to the last second to get ready. Folks, God has is desiring that we be like the ant right now. Start doing the work on our knees. I'm not talking about working for your salvation. I'm talking about that work where we begin to seek the face of the Lord and desire that he would share with us his will. You know, seek ye first. That's something we can do. The kingdom of God and all things shall be added unto you. Brother Jamie, I believe God is calling us to stop right now from this moment forward any more spiritual sluggardness or laziness in our lives and grow up. Absolutely. I mean, it, the scripture speaks so much to the complacent. Woe to the complacent. Woe to you who feel, feel secure in Samaria, you most notable, or who f- feel secure in Zion, you most notable men of the foremost nation who lounge on your couches. We're talked about the complacency of fools destroys them, right? Proverbs one or two, I don't know, somewhere in there. You can read it at all. And that way you can get the full context, but complacency is a big deal. And again, it goes back to that cowardice and what's at the root of complacency, a love of self. So we have been foretold that we will be lovers of self. We'll be lo- lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It is highly discomfort, it's uncomfortable, discomfortable. That's not even a word. It should be. That's a cool word. It's highly uncomfortable to be prudent it's uncomfortable to, to look like a fool to your family members and your friends. It's uncomfortable and the pride of your flesh wells up because you don't want to look foolish to your other members in your congregation. When you say, brothers and sisters, in prudence, let us prepare our hearts for the day of the Lord. Let us throw off any sin that so easily hinders and entangles us. Let us come out from among these Babylonian systems. Let us throw off all restraint and all this double-mindedness and seek the Lord. Let us in prudence practically prepare and be obedient to the words of Christ Jesus. When he told his disciples about the signs of the times and about his second coming, he said, I've told you about these things ahead of time. Why? So that you will not be caught unaware. I've, I've given you, I, how about ladies and gents, brothers and sisters, why don't we heed the command of Jesus Christ when he says, pray, pray that you would escape all these things. And how about we grow in a knowing of our God so that might, we might be strong through the Lord and go forth and do exploits, daring feats of valors to the glory of our God, to the saving of souls and to the increase of our joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Like this is what it's all centered on. So this idea of prudence is, is central to our Christian calling election. The my righteous ones will live by faith, and without faith, it's impossible to please me. We prepare in prudence, spiritually and physically and emotionally, out from faith, not from fear. If you're preparing out of fear, you're wrong. We prepare out of prudence because our Lord has said, I've told you about these things ahead of time. A prudent man foresees danger coming and plans accordingly. I've said to have an extra store of oil, like have extra stores and and be prepared, be waiting, looking, watching. It's going to be a long night. It's going to be a difficult night, but I'm coming. You must be prepared, vigilant, watchful, on guard, eager anticipation, longingly looking forward for me. And there's work to be done. 
And if you're running around unhinged because you can't provide for your own family because you didn't want to look foolish to the other members of your congregation, well, the Lord is in opposition to you because the Lord opposes the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. And you, if you have nothing to offer your lost and dying neighbors in a, in a way that you could hold out the gospel of truth that would cut off the curse of sin and death from them from everlasting to everlasting because you didn't want to look foolish, well, woe to you. If you sit in complacency and you say, I don't want to do these things again because of the pride of my flesh. I don't want to look foolish. Woe to you. We come forward by faith with what little we have, even with our little faith, with our little provisions, with things that we've moved out in prudence to do. And we say, Lord, this is all I have. God bless it. Lord, multiply it. Lord, use it to feed 5,000 people today. I got these couple fish and I got these couple loaves, but I'm bringing it to you, Lord. Do what only you can do. God, I, I, by faith, I foresaw the danger coming and I planned accordingly, God, not to save my own flesh, but that I might be able to hold out the word of truth and shine in this crooked and perverse generation like never before. God, Amen. be glorified through these things. Lord, use these things. I'm your servant. I'm a tool in your hand. Have me do whatever you would have me do. And that's something that the church needs to get focused on real quick. It's coming fast, ladies and gents. Uh, Brother Frank already touched on it. I won't go into all the details, global supply chain collapse and the international global food scarcity and the consolidation of power and control and where all this is going. But I'm telling you, it's right at the door. And again, we don't prepare out from fear. God's perfect love cast out all fear. Wherever, where you fear, you've not been perfected by his love. We prepare because we just want to be obedient to the Lord. We want to be tender for his heart for people. We want to be like Joseph who sees and knows and understands and goes, wow, man, man there's some lean times coming. So out from obedience and prudence, I'm going to, I'm going to be a good administrator of the resources that the Lord's put me in charge of so that we can actually preserve the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody get that about Joseph. It wasn't about Egypt. God used Joseph's prudence to preserve the bloodline, to bring his brothers and Jacob into the land of Egypt, to provide for them, to preserve the bloodline that was promised to lead to the savior of all humanity and the crushing of Satan under his heel, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the story of Joseph is all about. And again, it's that prudence and that spirit and that tenderness for the Lord and that surrendering of the whole tithe of our lives in the storehouse of God that made the way for that to happen. It's faith in action. You say you have faith. Well, good. Even the, even the demons believe in God, and at least they shudder. That faith without actions, faith without deeds is dead. We must put our faith into action and prepare to be the church to the church, prepare to be the body to the body, and prepare to hold out the word of truth in the lost and dying world. It's time to prepare now. Like, you know, brother, from the Marine Corps, you always train for the fight you're not yet in. We're Absolutely. always training for the fight we're not yet in. Because when it's beaten down your door, it's too late. Whatever you have stored up in you is all you're going to have to carry you through to the end of that, through the end of that fight. So that applies spiritually, that applies emotionally, and that applies applies physically. We train to walk by faith. Now we train to trust in the Lord. Now we train to, to intercede and pray. Now we try, we train to surrender that our hope is not in our own strength and our, and a horse is a vain deliverance for, 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 uh, our, a horse is a vain deliverance, a vain hope for deliverance. Sorry, I'm starting all over the place. And I don't trust in the size of my army, but I trust in the name of my, the Lord, my God. I fear him. My hope is in his unfailing love. He delivers me from death. He keeps me alive in famine. This is what we start training for now. You're so right. Folks, listen, th this is a, I want you to leave this episode with some hope. I do. Because our God is about hope. And, and what we're trying to share with you tonight is simply just a wake-up call. That's all. It, in order that you would understand the joys of what it means to be truly walking in faith. The only, re, the only thing I can share with you is just 
you know, when I'm in the mission field and, and I've, I'm so far away from home and I'm the only Mzungu, right, white man in the area, right? and, I'm, and I'm in foreign territory or all Muslim villages, you know, and, and sometimes I get afraid, you know, but you know what, the, I, I keep pushing through and I keep praying and God, I always see his hand of deliverance. When a marathon runner trains for a marathon, he never actually runs the full marathon. He runs up to a certain point and that's it. And then on the day he runs the whole race. Listen, God's, we're not going to get it all perfect. But we are in the battle, and when it comes time and it all falls apart, guess what? God will carry us through, brother and sister. He truly were will. But you know, the five, the foolish virgins, their biggest problem was they thought that they could get into the kingdom on someone else's oil. And see, if all we do is listen to podcasts, and or all we do is listen to YouTube and things, and I, I love everybody listens to the Remnant Call, but. If, if you not listening to the remnant call, meaning you were seeking the Lord and studying his word instead, then don't ever turn this show back on again. Please, please don't do that. I would rather you seek the Lord than ever listen to another episode of the remnant call because that's more important. I cannot save you. Jamie cannot save you. This program cannot save you, but Jesus Christ can. And the, the, the foolish virgins, they thought that somehow they could get on the, in the kingdom on someone else's oil. And so many people that go to church depend on their pastor or listen to podcasts, depend on the next new thing. And they're trying to ride in on someone else's oil. When the fact is that God wants you to have your own supply. And here's the cool thing. It doesn't matter if you've been eating with the pigs. It doesn't matter how filthy and how many times you've messed up and how much you failed the Lord. How, how you've ruined and spoiled your whole inheritance, how you've messed up and you've broken promises. If you come back, if you will cry out, the Bible says that he's faithful and just to forgive and will turn again. It's not his will that any should perish. And if it's not his will that any should perish, then any time he hears one of his children cry out as a tender-hearted, loving father, the Bible says, just like the prodigal son, when he saw his son coming afar off, that he took off running. And every scholar knows that, that product, the, the father is the, is the picture of our heavenly father. And the son ruined everything. And yet when he saw his heart, his father took off running. That's the good news. All the things that Jamie just shared earlier with you, which are so incredibly intense out of Deuteronomy, and they are so 100% true, that if it doesn't matter that you've maybe you've been a part of that, maybe I've been a part of that, but if at this moment tonight, if we said, you know what, I'm done with this, Lord, I've messed up so much, but right now I'm going to give my heart back to you and I'm coming back to you, your heavenly father will open up his arms and he will receive you with loving kindness and grace that you don't deserve, but he desires to give anyway. Because I can tell you right now, myself and Jamie have done everything wrong in this world at some point in my life. Amen, brother. Amen. Some part in Amen. our life, we have offended God. We have we have given the enemies of God a reason to scoff and reproach uh, about the, our own actions. We have messed it up. We are so far from perfect. And what we call upon is the name of Jesus. And we come to his, his mercy and grace and we fall down on our knees and we ask him for his forgiveness. And he is so faithful and just to do that. Brother, you know what it's like to mess up, but you also know what it's like to receive the loving grace. And I think, brother, right now, some people, they're worried and they're afraid. And some people have even listened to the lies of the devil, brother, that maybe they've gone too far. What would you say to somebody right now that maybe thinks that God, they're beyond God's hand of salvation? Oh, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. The sufficiency of Christ is so all surpassing that there's absolutely nothing, literally nothing. It says in all of creation. So, so what's that encompass all of creation? Uh, let's see angels and demons and light and darkness and disobedience and obedience and the things of the flesh and the things of the world and the things that create it. Literally nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God that has been past tense. It's so particular, has been past tense shown to you in Christ Jesus. Nothing while you were his enemy, while you were reprobate, when you were at your worst, when he saw you on top of that woman that was not your wife, when he saw you blaspheming him in the gutters, when he saw you rejecting the spirit of, of, of truth and running after your flesh, he already saw you in that moment. And maybe you haven't had your worst yet. 
He's already seen you in that moment too. And he looked on you with so much love. He so loved the world that he gave his only son while you were his enemy. How much more so is he going to be near to you now that he calls you friend? There is nothing that God has withheld from you. Nothing. While you were his enemy at your worst, there's nothing he's going to withhold from you now. And that's why I love the doxology in Jude. I absolutely love it because it's so simple. Now to him who is able to to keep you from stumbling and to present you before the father, blameless and with great joy to our only God, our savior, Lord and Jesus, Jesus, be all power and glory and honor and dominion, both now and forevermore to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before the father, blameless and with great joy. This is, is the testimony of Christ in you. This is the testimony of Christ over you. This is the testimony, the sufficiency of the blood of the lamb that we talked about. They overcame all y'all, all the powers of darkness, all that the antichrist, all that the machinations of the global elite want to throw at us. They, we overcome it by the blood of the lamb because it's that blood that is our righteousness. It's that blood that is our salvation. It's that blood that is our shield of faithfulness to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. It is the blood of that lamb that is the true Truth that we now walk in. It is the blood of the lamb that is now the, the, the combat boots on my feet, the gospel of peace where once I was an enemy. And now God says, I'm at peace with you, son. I no longer call you a child of wrath. I call you a child of glory. You're no longer heirs of wrath and sons of disobedience. You're a son of the most high. Here's the ring on your finger, a signet ring. Here's the cloak on your back. Come eat and sup with me. Everything that belongs to my son belongs to you. Your inheritance is kept in heaven for you, spotless, unspoiled, unfading. And here's the good promise in first Peter one is that God's going to get you home to it by his power. Praise be to God. It has nothing to do with your power to get there by his power. He's going to get you there. So there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, nothing. And all the shame and all the reproach and all the condemnation and all the carnal leanings and all the double mindedness and all the weakness and failings of our flesh. He saw it all. And he looked on you with doting eyes and he said, here, let me, I will become sin itself. So that you will become my righteousness. I will become your sin so that not one spot or blemish remains on you and you shall become my righteousness. Oh my goodness. What good news. And so when he says, if you confess, if you confess your sins, that he's faithful and just and heals you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You're clean. You're, you are in white raiments. You are spotless and blameless, positioning before the Lord. Listen, we know what we are every day. Brother Frank and I know what we are every day. We are weak and weary sinners, treading water like everybody else, just hoping we don't grieve the Lord again and again and again each day. But positionally before the Lord, Lord Most High, I also know what I am. I know that I am blameless, spotless, and holy. I don't know how it works. I just praise God. Because I have nothing to bring to the table other than my carnality. And yet I know Christ in me. See, this is the word of our testimony. That is the blood of the lamb. And that's why we don't love our lives so much as we're afraid to lose it. It's hidden in Christ. I'm good to go, ladies and gents. And that is what overcomes all this. And that is what fills us with the love of God that cast out all fear, even fear of falling short. Even fear of condemnation, fear from within, fear without. All enemies, foreign and domestic, have no bearing on me because I know my God and I know his son, Jesus Christ. So, brother, yeah, there's, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But it's all about that if, if you confess, if you confess, humble yourself enough, be willing to humble yourself enough and the presence of the Lord to say, Lord, I can't. I can't do it. Lord, I need you. Lord, my righteousness and all my acts are not sufficient. God, I, I can't earn it. I can't work it. I can't strive it. Lord, Lord, my, my I fail. I'm double-minded. I'm all over the place. I keep returning to my vomit, God. But Lord, I know that your blood was sufficient to cover that. So I'm just confessing it to you, God. Take it from me. Take it from me. 
I want no part of it, God. Fill me with your righteousness. Stand me back on my feet, God. Make me fit for battle because your power in me, I know that you'll equip me to go forth and do daring feats of valor to glorify your name. Lord, I've spent enough time doing what the pagans did. I spent enough time in the darkness, Lord. I want to glorify you and proclaim your excellencies in the land of the living. And guess what? He is faithful and just to satisfy the desires of your heart. He will do it. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Folks, I I tell you, as Jamie was sharing these things, I'm just running through my mind of all so much mercy that God's shown me through the years. I I need to, I haven't had my wife on this program since I think when we first started back in 2016, a few episodes in, and um, I'm going to get her on the program and and, um, (laughs) let you hear what God can bring a family through. Because I've done everything you could ever imagine wrong. I have been the worst husband that you could ever imagine at times. I've ran around. I've did everything. I was violent, not, not towards my wife, but towards other men. I've, I've just did it all. I've almost lost everything in the fact that my wife's still with me. 20 some years later, 22 years now is an absolute miracle. And I'm telling you right now, if God can save me, he can save anybody. I'm going to be having on the few weeks, my cousin, I've talked to you in the past, David, who's coming to the Lord, 20 some year cocaine habit, all the things that we did together. And we've been talking here all the time about God's goodness. And I'm watching the Lord. He's bringing the whole family home. He's bringing the whole family in. And we are, we, I come from some messed up stock. But you know what? I've also watched God do the impossible time and time again. And I'm I'm a firm believer that in this hour, he is in the business of saving those who look unsavable. I believe with all my heart that those that the world looks down upon, God looks at and says, you know what? I'm going to show you what my power can do. God is a miracle worker, and we are testimonies, myself and Jamie, at the goodness of his mercies. Not because we came from some line of prophets. No, quite the opposite. We're just common people who've done a lot of mistakes. But we remembered to cry out in our moment of crisis to the one who could save. And you know what? He was faithful and just to do it. Brother, I thank you for coming on here and reminding us that God is good and that yes, his judgments are true, but there is a alternate plan for those who call upon his name. Amen. Amen. And I I always think of the simplicity of the words and hope will not disappoint. I just, I think about that all the time. We are not going to be disappointed though. We may have suffered for it. We may need to suffer for a little while, though these things have come upon you to test you. Though there's pain in the offering, they are light and momentary afflictions compared to the all suppressing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus and being unified with him. And I, I just know, I know that I know that I know, and there's nothing that could change the fact that I know that my hope will not disappoint. And I know that one day soon, my faith will become sight and my hope will come to fruition. And the only thing that's left is the love of the Lord and to love one another in full in his presence from everlasting to everlasting. And so it's for the joy set before me that we endure all these things, even the battle of our flesh and spirit for the joy set before us We engage in the fight. We fight the good fight. We run the race well. We withhold nothing because he withheld nothing. We're unrestrained because he was unrestrained. We're prodigal towards him because he was prodigal towards us. And we fight this good fight knowing that it is not in vain. And I can't wait, brother. I can't wait. And I know I'm a fool and I don't have a clue what's going to be required of us. I know I'm a fool and I don't have a clue what the depth of true suffering is. I've been in combat zones. I've been a street cop. I've been a street medic fire. I've been, I mean, I've been in all, but I know that I, I have no clue what suffering may be required of me, but I do know my God. And that's sufficient for me this Amen. day and every day until he calls me home or, or uh, he returns. Amen. Thank you so much folks. I'm just, you know, just, I'm just, you know, thinking here, 
all the times that I've messed up so much and, uh, and deserve death. And yet I've had the honor. I was being in the baptismal with my oldest daughter and then baptizing my youngest daughter. And now here's my youngest daughter going out on her first mission trip. Praise God. I totally don't deserve any of it. But that's the one that we serve. And I, and I just sit here and sometimes in awe and wonder that God could save someone like me. And I'm telling you, folks, he can save anybody. And I believe he has pleasure in saving people just like me, Amen. just like Jamie, just like you. And even though we've messed up, it's just that one little measure of faith from the bottom of the heart that cries out. And he's like, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Because any one of you would do the same for your children. Amen. How much greater is he whose motives are pure? Brother, thank you for coming on tonight. Folks, please keep in touch with what Jamie's doing. I know, brother, you're coming up very soon. You're going to be at the conference in Texas, correct? Yeah, yeah. Actually, if there is anybody in the area who wants to travel, it's the Hear the Watchman um, conference in Grapevine, Texas. It's actually next week, and I think it's the 17th through the 20th. And um, just it's always an amazing time of fellowship. And if there's any time that we need to be found gathering together and encouraging one another, even more so as we see the day of the Lord approaching, it's right now. So, yeah, come out to Grapevine, and it's going to be a, a an amazingly blessed conference. So. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Folks, you can keep up with Jamie on omegadynamics.org. And of course, you have a Facebook page, Jamie Walden. You can find him on Facebook and keep up what's going on in this ministry. And folks, it's not going to be too much longer. One day, we're all going to be sitting around. I hope, Lord willing, we can have a remnant call in the kingdom. Okay. Amen. But I'm going to have Jesus. That's my guest. Actually, I'm the Amen. guest. You know what I mean? I'd be like, sorry, I've got the best person ever on the remnant call tonight and we can just sit around and fellowship by the sea of glass in glory eating from the tree of life no longer will there be any disease but we will be living in the fullness of his glory and i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to the day to handing over the kids and saying look he comes and say lord here they are i'm so glad you made it because I am so ready to get out of this place, brother. I know you're Amen. looking forward to it too. It won't be much longer, folks. Please keep the faith. Hang on. God's got this thing. He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. This is Brother Frank and Brother Jamie Walden on the Remnant Call saying to everybody, good night and shalom. Trumpet in Zion, sounded on the mountains. Blow a trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is come. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sounded on the mountains. Blow a trumpet in